so often we imagine, of course, as kids that our parents are more powerful than they are, and we can't believe, in a sense, in their powerlessness. We don't want to believe in their powerlessness right. because they're supposed to be the caregivers. And, and what does it mean if they're powerless to save us? Do you like books? I'm outlining a new writing project. Who wrote this book? Read it. Read it. Sometimes I'd write something. What are you writing? Have you written anything lately? I'm Amanda Stern, and this is Bookable. On today's show, what are we leaving our kids? So much of how we talk about inheritance is all about passing wealth from one generation to the next. But there's one thing all children will inherit, and that's the planet. We've only got one planet. Only one? Yeah, just one. It's the thing that literally sustains our lives. And yet, we've had an entire generation or two who have essentially spent that inheritance and ignored the peril of doing so. Gone! It's all gone. We spent all of it. But it's our inheritance. Well, our guest today... Amanda, hi. I'm not she uses her new book to tackle this weighty topic with sharp biting humor. So I'm mostly in my bedroom, um, which is mostly enclosed. There's the doors. Time for an introduction. My name is Lydia Millett, and I'm the author of A Children's Bible. Lydia Millett. A Children's Bible is a novel about apocalyptic chaos that upends a summer vacation of kids and their absent and drunk parents. Or as Lydia puts it, it's a bunch of kids who are just repulsed by their parents living in a summer house, and things happen. Oh yeah, do things happen? So there's 12 children who've never met before, and their parents who haven't seen each other in years, and they're spending a summer together in a lakeside mansion built by robber barons. So far, so good? Yes, very, very good. They are playing a game to distract themselves, to prevent themselves from being more bored than they have to be because their parents have taken away all their electronic devices. And so they play this game where you want to be the, the last one to be actually affiliated by the others with a given parent as your own. So you want to be the last man standing whose parentage has not yet been discovered because the parents are so embarrassing that you don't, you know, you don't wish others to see the connection between them and you. And the truth is they really are embarrassing. Like they're, they're mortifying and they're <laughs> more like, they're more like children than their actual children. <laughs> yeah. In some ways, cause they're, they're self-indulgent and they're, they're hedonistic and um, they are not self-aware in many cases. So, yeah, although, I mean, can't those things be said of all of us, really, children and adults alike, to some degree? Yeah, to some degree, yes. But, um, but I feel like they really wanted a summer without their kids, but they brought their kids anyway and just <laughs> acted like the kids weren't there. Although if they if they had truly, truly wanted a summer without their kids, they should have left them with the devices, right? I mean, that's how you get True. alone time as a parent. You just let them play the video games. Although I didn't I didn't in the book really explain the genesis of that of that prohibition, you know, on the part of the parents. I didn't really explain why they took away the devices. Although you assume it's so that they're not dependent on them. They're not staring them at, at them all the time. They're right. they're forging social bonds, you know, among themselves, the kids. But really, they're they are such bad parents that, in a way, you could you could uh, rationally ask why why they would care whether the children interacted with each other, um, right? Yes, true. But it's also, I found that the parents are so out of, like, they are so not interested in reality that um, they don't want to face reality. They're doing as much as they can not to deal with reality, that the phones mm -hmm. themselves sort of represent reality. So they don't want to be told mm. of anything that's going on. They don't want to be reminded of what's happening in the actual world. 
That's true. It, it, it evolves into that uh, as the story goes on, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah I, I, and at first, they themselves are allowed to have their devices, of course, um, but the children aren't. But then later, the positions are sort of reversed. From a children's Bible, page 11. We were strict with the parents. Punitive measures were taken. Thievery, mockery, contamination of food and drink. They didn't notice. And we believed the punishments fit the crimes. Although the worst of those crimes was hard to pin down and therefore hard to punish correctly. The very quality of their being, the essence of their personalities. Reading the book, I was realizing that the children in the book, they deal with reality as it comes crashing down on them, and it does come crashing down on them, Um, unlike their parents who live in this fantasy, or rather, more accurately, uh, type of Eden. Um, And the children, meanwhile, would rather face the truth. So I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about how those two generations deal with reality. Yeah, well, I think my generation, which I'm 51 now, my generation of parents has really abdicated their responsibility to be genuine parents, you know, to be to be future ancestors, as the hippies like to say. Um, We have uh, sort of thought of parenting and I'm talking about people of a certain demographic, which is the demographic of these parents in the book, uh, that is to say a sort of liberal or progressive, um, middle class, upper middle class, or wealthy, however you care to define those things, um, sort of arty or intellectual cultural, cultural producers, sort of, sort of group of people that are Mm -hmm. fairly urban and fairly, fairly educated and sophisticated, but they, um, they practice this sort of not denialism of climate science, like, like Trump and um, Republican senators or whatever, but a denialism of sort of just the urgency of real life and the and the and the imminence of of transformation and and the sort of the the way in which chaos looms and complacency is um, is what they always default to. Um, but I think that younger people now, uh, mm-hmm. I think that people who are in their teens, and I observe it, it's fairly clear in social media, but also just in the in the media media and in the world, um, that people in their, not all people, but many, many more people in their teens and 20s and 30s are actively engaged with the problem Mm -hmm. of the future and it's not uncool to talk about climate change or the extinction crisis the way it used to be for us it was it was seen almost as um uh tedious and whiny to bring up these existential life support crises that actually hung over us now it's not that way for younger people Uh, i would say up you know up through people in their 30s um there's real agitation and um, and fear and anger around these these crises and um, and it's palpable and it's it's real like it's an anger that you really can observe mm-hmm. and if you go especially to like extinction rebellion meetings or if like me you work in uh, in conservation on these things you really do see it uh, and I'm just so overjoyed that the rage that we should have felt decades ago is finally surfacing. Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's very late, but it's, it's late. great that it's, it's happening. Late, yeah. Not late for them, of course, not late for no. like people who are 15, but like, but for us, yeah, it's been so long coming that uh, it's, it's a relief, really. From a children's Bible, page 27. At that time in my personal life, I was coming to grips with the end of the world. The familiar world, anyway. Many of us were. Scientists said it was ending now. Philosophers said it had always been ending. 
a decade ago, or maybe a little more, this book would have been called dystopian, but it lands in the world at a time when it's actually current. Do you have <laughs> any feelings about this book being labeled <laughs> environmental fiction and at all? Well, you know, I've never, I've just never liked the word environment or environmental. It sounds so wonky and it's so, it's so bloodless, you know, mm. really we're talking about life support, life support. That's what we're talking about. And even that mm -hmm. is sort of clinical sanding, isn't it? Like a series of machines hooked up to, to a moribund patient or something like that. But really we're talking about that which sustains our lives and, and upon which we're entirely dependent. And, um, and that's what we mean when we talk about the environment, really. And so uh, still, I don't like really the ring of environmental fiction. <laughs> I don't like mm -hmm. the ring of it, you know, like, I think of myself as writing general literary fiction. And I think that these are general matters. These subjects are general of general interest, you know, <laughs> certainly um, should be compelling to any of us who care to continue to live. And I think that is a majority of us really at any given time uh, who could, you know, who prefer to continue to live and who wish also <laughs> any children they have to, for example, continue to live. So I think it should be referred to as more general fiction. I do, you know, I do also, um, and of course there are exceptions to this, but uh, I sometimes associate environmental fiction with humorless, um, mm. with humorless fiction, which is is partly unfair because it's it's simply not always the case. But th there's kind of a there's kind of a certain you know timber of that right, or a certain um, uh, stigma almost of humorlessness, even associated with the movement in general. And that too is unfair actually, and somewhat manufactured, but that's another conversation. But I, so I, and I, it is so important to me that, um, and as a reader also, again, always that things contain the comic and, um, even sometimes a certain brutal savagery of humor I, I like to see you know so um and it, and so to say environmental fiction or something uh of work that also wishes to have a comedic side I think is I don't know it feels a bit constraining it's just an embarrassment of marketing I think you know it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes it's just yeah. something they came yeah. up with in a meeting yeah. but I I came across a term um that I I, I almost I, like just left the world. Cli-fi? Cli-fi, Cli-fi. Yeah, no, it's awful. It's terrible. Um, but we I were... Mean, I, I sort of... I don't like the term sci-fi for science fiction even, you know, uh, although I'm not saying I've never used it. I'm I'm sure that I have fallen into using that, you know, sci-fi or sci-fi fantasy or I'm sure I've said that. But at the same time, I don't, I don't particularly like that kind of I don't know, shortening or the, that kind of short hand yeah. in general. But there is really, there is climate fiction now um, that does exist as a thing. And I don't know. I mean, I, there should also be extinction fiction. <laughs> we should, you know, for the yeah. first time we're, we're giving more attention to climate over the past three years because, because, you know, because of obvious reasons having to do with the nihilism at the, at the top of the country, but um, but we, I think, are also beginning to look more than we have in the past at extinction and and what what how enormous and vast that that tragedy is as well. And so I'm happy that I'm happy that we're giving these things more time on the airwaves and more time on the screen, and that finally they seem to be getting more of their due. And I hope it's a linear progress. You know, I hope it's not just a, I hope it's not just a blip. Time for a short break. When we come back, Lydia shows us her inner child. Stick around. Failure, anger, and even wrinkles are always tricky things to grapple with and accept. But as you get older, you begin to learn how to embrace it all because you know everything will be fine. 
Join former Lucky Magazine founding editor Kim France and documentary filmmaker Tally Abacassis as they give us an inside look as to how they're navigating life after 40 in the podcast, Everything is Fine. Kim and Tally have honest conversations with guests about their fears, health, careers, self-care, and how to navigate being called middle-aged when they feel anything but. Whether it's what to do about gray hair, tips on always looking well-dressed, overcoming being fired, or discussing the power of being pissed off, they're always empathetic, insightful, and most of all, entertaining. Subscribe to Everything is Fine wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to Bookable. I'm Amanda Stern, here with Lydia Millett, author of A Children's Bible. Lydia has a particular gift for writing children, and it's not an accident. There are a lot of ways she still identifies with kids. I do have um, this sort of need for instant gratification that many children have and babies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. that I think I have that. Um, also, I, I do have a kind of honesty, I think, uh, on a personal level. Not, not a perfect honesty by any means, and I'm not saying this to brag, but the kind of honesty that can embarrass people sometimes and and get you in hot water and where you don't you don't think before you speak and something comes out you know blurted <laughs> i mean right I, I don't i don't think that children have um a monopoly on that at all in general but i do think they're more prone to be you know uh unaware of the effects of some of their language at least little children teens probably are are actually uh, peculiar peculiarly sensitive even without full access to empathy because of sort of social anxiety and stuff probably more sensitive to to the way um blunt language can land uh i would guess but i mean of course that's like i'm making a generalization there but um also i you know, I love animals now the way I did as a child. And what I'm interested in doing with fiction really has more to do with exploring the otherness of animals and, and our love for them and the way and the way they play into our ideas of who we are. Mm-hmm. When I say animal, I mean all the beasts. And I also just mean anything green, anything that lives. You know, mm-hmm. We've turned away from all of that. And uh, it's not it's it's harming us profoundly and it's actually robbing us of our life support so <laughs> i think it's of uh paramount importance this way we've all turned away from the other creatures because people are are partly all these other creatures that we've co-evolved with since forever right and we we even our language is saturated with them we don't have metaphor without animals we 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 invoke their names all the time and don't even realize that, you know, everything about us is built on our situation with these other, these others that we, that we now either ignore or exploit or traffic to our own, you know, um, to our own unfortunate peril, I guess. (laughs) I mean, obviously, you know, we're sitting here in the middle of pandemic that was caused by, uh, for, first of all, caused by the exploitation of wildlife, like right. pangolins and civets and uh, bats, and then, of course, exacerbated by by poor management, you know, on a national level. But first of all, mm-hmm. was was brought to us by our exploitation of wildlife, and um, so I think we have really direct evidence right now in our faces um, for for how you know how profound our connection is to everything and how delicate it is, actually. From a children's Bible, page 15. My own parents were mother scholar, father artist. My mother taught feminist theory, and my father sculpted enormous, busty women, lips, breasts, and private parts garishly painted. Often with scenes of war-torn or famine-struck locations. 
The labia might be Mogadishu. He was quite successful. It's interesting, you do something with this novel that I just, like, I, I, my actual question is in all caps, um, the second half. So I wrote, um, it's such a heavy topic, and yet you brought such lyricism and humor to the page. And then in all caps, I wrote, how did you do that? I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's like really hysterically funny. You know, yeah, the, I'm really happy the labia... The labia is Mogadishu. I mean, it's hysterical. <laughs> it's, it's like th- truly some of the funniest writing I've I've read in a really long time, and it's the such a heavy topic, but it's just buoyant. And I, I just don't know how you did that. I really don't. And maybe well, you don't you either. Made me, you made me very happy saying that. I think it's just about, isn't it? Just about the characters and how you, and how you make them be in moments of dialogue. I mean, it's not all about dialogue, of course, and that's often not the funniest part, right? It's not dialogue, but the dialogue and the and the those kids and their voices allow you to be immediate even when the background or even the foreground is something looming and dreadful. I think as long as you have people you'll always have humor yeah but i do think in, that in, a lot of it in the real world anyway right in the real world not oh, the yes, fiction yes. <laughs> but yeah um, right. sorry I no 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 it, i was just gonna say that it's to me i could tell you were having so much fun yeah you know it felt like writing this book was a great deal of fun that is uh was my, it yes it was of course it was that is how i approach each book. <laughs> no, I always yeah, want Yeah, that's to, great. You know, I, I but I do I want to um I want to evoke a full range of emotions in myself. So, but I but I but humor like I have to laugh sometimes. I have to be able to make myself laugh cuz you know, uh if you if you don't laugh yourself, I feel few others will laugh, right? <laughs> and, and but also just that it's so it's so pleasurable. It's so it's so pleasurable and also, but I, but if I, I also have to feel like tears come to my eyes at a certain point or I, I've not done my job. Lydia Millet, author of A Children's Bible. It's published by W.W. W. Norton and & Company and is available now. Bookable is a production of Loud Tree Media. I'm your host, Amanda Stern, five feet tall. You know, kid height. We're produced by me, Bo Friedlander, and Andrew Dunn, who also mixed and sound designed the show. Bo is Loudtree's editor-in-chief. Find us on the web at bookablepod.com, and please subscribe and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. That's one of the best ways for other listeners to find Bookable. One big takeaway from this interview, when it comes to categorizing Lydia's novel, it's best to double check your phrasing before quoting it to her. When you said that, I thought you were like talking about porn for a second. I was no, like, wow, but that's what I, I that, it said, really, <laughs> that's what I was like, it sounds like porn. Cly-fi, yeah, it was cly-fi. But then I kept thinking Yeah, no, it's awful, it's terrible. This is Bookable. Loudtree. Hey guys, it's Amanda, here to tell you about a new podcast from the producers of Forever 35 called Gee Thanks, Just Bought It. Hosted by author and shopping guru Caroline Moss, G Thanks Just Bought It shares all the life-changing, under-the-radar products you didn't think you needed. What do I mean by that, you ask? Well, how about hand warmers that double as phone chargers, foot hammocks, fake shirt collars, the perfect spatula, full face ice masks, yeah, they exist, and much more. Her mission is not to get you to buy everything, but to hear from trusted guests about the products you may be looking for. 
Listen to New York Times bestselling author Ellen Hillebrand on why you need a pepper grinder. Birchbox co-founder Molly Chen on her Tiny Tongs obsession. And author-comedian Samantha Irby's favorite travel bidet. And of course, we'll hear from the guru herself on something she's loving that week. Shop and subscribe now to G Thanks, Just Bought It, wherever you listen to podcasts.